Yeah, uh, hi everybody. Um, first of all, thanks for, for inviting me to, to give this lecture here. Um, so, um, yeah, when I, when I got invited here, the, the title that was suggested by the, by the organizers was uh, Quantum Mechanics and Gravitation, What We Know and What We Don't Know. So um, I thought, well, that's a nice title, but um, there isn't really that much that we know, and I can't really talk that much about the things that we don't know for obvious reasons. So, um, and I think actually most of the most of the things that are being done in this in this field of uh, yeah gravitational phenomena in quantum systems are things that I would probably put in the category what we think we know. So there are some equations, there are some derivations, but they are more based on like yeah, rather ad hoc principles. So um, yeah, so I uh, amended that to to the title of the talk, and um, yeah, but I'm talking about quantum mechanics and gravitation. And um, maybe first of all, I should uh, I should make clear that what I mean by that is so this will not be a lecture about quantum gravity. Um, I'm talking about quantum mechanics plus gravity. So so what are effects of gravity that we might be able to observe in, in quantum mechanical systems like we find them in the, in the laboratory. Um, <clears throat> so mainly non-relativistic quantum mechanics and like what corrections uh, gravity might, uh, might induce um, or maybe what effect of a possible quantization of gravity could perhaps show up uh, even in, in such systems. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the in the non-relativistic or in the in the low energy limit of a quantum gravity theory or a full theory that combines quantum mechanics uh, with gravity. Um, and it actually turns out that there there are a lot of things even in that regime that we don't fully understand yet or that that are are interesting to consider, um, especially with with uh, yeah with regard to um, what are things that we might be able to test in, in experiments in the not too far future, right? So, um, so this lecture will also be more a broad overview over topics and not so much, uh, yeah, a deep discussion of, of something specific. Um, I will start with, with some rather, uh, rather, um, yeah, introductory things, and then probably in the in the second or third lecture. Uh, come to more to the things that uh, that I'm also working on. Um, just to to start with, maybe uh, a quick motivation about um, why this is an interesting question. I mean, when people talk about quantum gravity, um, then you usually hear um, that this, this is necessary to describe situations like black like holes or the early universe. Um, there is something much simpler that you can think about, which is uh, the double slit experiment. So you have a massive particle, right? You send it through through your double slit. Um, so um, and and you put uh, some some test particles, some test mass here. And what you're asking is, okay, if I have this situation, if I do this experiment um, with a, with a system that is sufficiently massive. What happens? What happens to this uh, test particle? We know classically, if we have a particle here, then um, general relativity tells us that this particle curves the space-time around it, um, and and our test particle feels this this space-time curvature and will will move towards yeah towards this massive particle. On the other hand, if we if we have our particle here instead, um, then we will have the opposite situation. So space-time curves in a different way. We have this particle moving towards the other direction. And if we do this experiment now with a, with a quantum system, with a quantum particle, then we know that we will have a superposition of this of this particle being of the particle being here and the particle being here. So um, the, the very simple question, which is kind of 
the basis of yeah what uh, what happens with gravity in in the in the quantum regime is uh, what what will happen to this test particle so um, will it also be in a superposition of moving up or down or is something else happening well maybe there still be some space time curvature that that is somehow determined by the superposition state um, and of course there are expectations like when you think about uh, that that quantum gravity is, is uh, like the the um, limit of uh, sorry the other way around that quantum gravity is some ultimate theory that as its limit at low energies has something that is uh, basically works the same as uh, the other quantum theories we know, like in analogy to electrodynamics, for example, um, then you know what the, the right answer is that the gravitational field in this case is also in a superposition, so the particle will actually also, the test particle will also be in a superposition state. But from the point of view, what is experimentally established, the, the most honest answer is just we don't know yet what happens. We have no idea. So, um, so this is kind of the, the motivation about why I think uh, this is this is an interesting uh, an interesting topic, and um, I just want to first give you uh, the outline of the of the lecture that I want to give. Um, so, um, as an introduction, I would like to start with something that's. Uh, neither quantum nor gravity, um, which is just the mechanics of a point mass. Um, and I will just give some some um, arguments of uh, how we how we can obtain uh, the, the Schrödinger equation from from um, classical systems. Um, <clears throat> then I will give a very uh, short overview about uh, about general re relativity, um, especially uh, talk about the Newtonian limit of the theory and. Uh, how in the classical theory uh, matter is coupled to, to gravitation. And um, the, third, uh, the third chapter will be about basically the what we know part, so what is experimentally established, um, and that is um, non-relativistic uh, particles in Newtonian gravity. <clears throat> the fourth section, then I will um, discuss a bit uh, the equivalence principle. <clears throat> and what it means in, 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 uh, in connection with, with quantum mechanics. Um, <clears throat> then I will basically come to the part that we don't know, which is uh, quantum gravity. Um, so I call the chapter quantum gravity pros and cons. Um, so I'm uh, mainly concerned about the question, okay, why do we think that we need to quantize gravity, or what are the arguments for quantizing gravity, and um, yeah, what are, what are maybe the alternatives to quantizing gravity, or is it, what do we know about why it is necessary to quantize gravity, or is it maybe not necessary to quantize gravity? Um, and then, uh, finally, I want to, so in, in this uh, chapter, I will also talk about like a semi-classical uh, approach to, uh, yeah, to quantum plus gravity, and uh, and I will talk uh, very briefly about the idea that uh, gravity might be uh, the cause of the of the wave function collapse, um, and then finally, um, this is more the what we think we know part is uh, discuss uh, quantum mechanics in curved space time. Uh, 
um, beyond Newton. So um, so what can we say basically about general relativistic yeah, corrections or extensions to the experiments that have been, that have been done? <coughs> Okay, so let me start with the, with the first chapter. Okay, maybe I should say, so if you can't, if, if anything I write, you can read, uh, just, uh, just say something. Also, if you have any questions in between, just feel free to, to ask questions at any time. Um, <clears throat> So let me start with the relativistic point particle. <clears throat> so um, first, uh, non-relativistically, um, we know if we want to describe a point particle, we have a Lagrange function, which is kinetic minus potential energy. So um, this is one half times mass times uh, the velocity squared minus uh, the potential energy. So um, then we know that if we have our Lagrange function, we can find uh, the canonical momentum or the, the three uh, canonical momenta, which are just Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, the, the headline is a bit misleading. I want to discuss the non-relativistic one first to then discuss the relativistic one in analogy. Um, <laughs> yes, I just didn't want to put two headlines. Um, okay, so I'm still in the non-relativistic case here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we just take the derivative by the, by the coordinates, uh, sorry, by the, by the velocities. <clears throat> gives us the usual expression for the momentum and we find that. Um, and when we have this, we can define a Hamiltonian um, with, the, with the usual uh, Legendre uh, transform. So this is <coughs> pi x i dot minus L. And we get the expression that we, that we know is uh, p squared divided by m plus v of x, the potential. And then um, the usual textbook approach is to canonically quantize this. So basically, um, we replace the momentum uh, by minus i h bar gradient. <clears throat> and from that, we get the Schrödinger equation, uh, i h bar derivative of psi equals, and then we have this, this Hamiltonian, so minus h bar squared divided by 2m, sorry, Laplace operator acting on psi plus v psi. <clears throat> so this is in the non-relativistic case, and um, so if we, if we do the same relativistically, um, then the, the Lagrangian in the relativistic case is uh, minus mc square root of minus at time you knew x dot mu x dot mu <coughs> where um, the x zero coordinate is p times t and uh, for, the, for the metric um, I used the mostly plus signature, so the metric is minus one, 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 one. Um, um, so we can do the same thing. We can, we can uh, define canonical momenta, <coughs> which are mc x dot divided by, and then we have uh, the square root, which is just b squared minus dot squared. Um, 
<coughs> okay, we can calculate p squared from this. Um, which is m squared c squared dot squared divided by c squared minus dot squared. <coughs> and then we can solve this for x dot squared. Uh, C squared divided by m c m squared c squared exactly plus uh, c squared. <coughs> so um, this way we can get our uh, our coordinates in terms of the in terms of the momenta. So we have uh, sorry not the coordinates the velocities. So we have x i dot uh, equals Pic divided by square root uh, m squared c squared plus c squared. <clears throat> Is it yes? Bigger? Oh, okay. Yes, I try to. <laughs> okay. So um, with this, um, we can then again get our uh, our Hamilton function. <clears throat> same way, so pi times xi dot minus l. Uh, pi xi dot gives us uh, p squared um, p squared c divided by uh, square root m squared c squared Then we have plus mc square root uh, c squared minus, it's still not that much bigger, okay, b squared, c squared divided by um, m squared c squared plus b squared. Which, uh, yeah, further simplifies to um, <clears throat> sorry, if I just, so you, you um, take out the square root um, and then you end up with the usual expression. So square root m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. So <clears throat> that's not surprising. That's just the usual uh, energy momentum relation that you know from, uh, from special relativity. Um, So, um, so we have a Hamiltonian for, for this uh, relativistic particle, and now we could start wonder again. Okay, what's with the what's with the quantization? But if we want to do the same procedure, then we see already that we have to take the square root of the of the uh, Laplace operator here, which um, is mathematically possible, but doesn't give really helpful theories. Um, <clears throat> But what we can do instead is we can just uh, we can just expand this square root to to get corrections to our to our non-relativistic Hamiltonian. Um, so we can write this as m c squared plus, and then the non-relativistic term c squared divided by two m, and then we get as the first first order correction we get minus p to the fourth divided by eight m to the 3 c squared, and then we have higher orders in 1 over c squared, so 1 over c to the minus 4. <coughs> and uh, so, and this we can, so this is completely fine, right? So there we can, we can uh, do our, our canonical quantization procedure, so we could replace the, the momentum uh, by, by, the, uh, <coughs> by the gradient, and um, and we would get a, a Schrödinger equation, or corrected Schrödinger equation, i h bar, m derivative of psi equals, and then with the non-relativistic term, h bar squared divided by 2m plus psi. And we get higher order corrections. We get minus h bar to the fourth d 
divided by 8m to the 3 c squared. And then we get the Laplace operator acting twice on, on the state, plus higher orders. So, um, so this is kind of a, a relativistic uh, free Schrödinger equation, right? We could also, um, we could also uh, find uh, uh, Fox space, uh, yes? I was writing, you, where this comes from, you want to, or, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry, yes. Um, the, the MC squared term is in principle there, right? Um, but if you think about the Schrödinger evolution, then this just gives you a constant phase that does, that does not matter. Sorry, yes, I should have been precise and, and added that here, yes. Um, I understand your question. <laughs> okay, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so we can also, we can also uh, find a formulation in Fox space uh, for, for non-relativistic, uh, quantum mechanics in general, and we can extend this to to this case. So we can introduce uh, field operators, non-relativistic field operators that have the, the usual uh, commutation relations. So we have the phi um, of time and position, which uh, which has the following commutators so of phi of tr with uh, phi dagger of t and r prime is just the delta function r minus r prime. Um, well, all the other commutators are zero. <coughs> and then we can define an, an end particle state. Um, <coughs> as one divided by square root um, n factorial. Um, and then we integrate over all the all the coordinates. <clears throat> and apply all these um, creation operators by dagger. Um, ground state multiplied with some n particle wave function. Phi n of t r1 to rn. <coughs> okay, so this. Um, I didn't, uh, it's just the, the, the usual the, uh, generation operators that, that create all of the, yeah, like the. the Yeah, so, so oh, sorry, um, so you would, uh, so the question is basically um, if we have, if we have a, if we have a Schrodinger field and we want to do the, the usual, the Fox space uh, description like we do, like we do with, with for example, the Klein Gordon field in quantum field theory, right, then you can, you can do the same with the, with the, uh, with the Schrodinger field. And uh, you basically get the Fox space Schrodinger equation then that um, that corresponds to your to your uh, to your Schrodinger equation for the for the wave function. So you have uh, so this is basically just I will I will uh, need that later again. So that's why I why I introduce it here. Um, the um, the point is that there is no problem with this with this uh, Schrodinger equation to also to also introduce a, like a Fox space description. Or a field uh, field description. So um, the the main uh, the main thing that I that I need here is then so we have uh, a Fox space uh, <coughs> Hamilton operator. Which uh, looks like this. So we have sine dagger of of 
R, and then we have the, the usual Hamilton operator, so minus I, H bar squared divided by 2M, Laplace operator. Um, the one particle part of the potential, and on psi of R, uh, plus, and then we can have uh, the two particle contributions, d3 r, d3 r prime. Um, omega r and r prime. Um, and then we can have a two particle potential that depends on both coordinates, r and r prime. <coughs> So, um, yeah. sorry, you, can you speak a bit louder? You're talking about this equation? This one. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not. Sure. I, I want to <laughs> I want to basically comment why this does not work in in a, in a minute. So uh, I'm I'm not really sure if for the Fox, but I'm um, I don't like if you just introduce the the second or these these higher derivative terms here. Um, I don't see why you should get a problem. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understand what you what you mean. Maybe we can maybe we can discuss uh, you know, later. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, the main point of this is to say there is uh, th there is such a Fox space description in principle, and we can actually we find uh, the uh, correspondence here between the the uh, Schrödinger equation in Fox space, which um, has just the time evolution operator acting on this uh, state psi n. Um, so this state evolves with this with this Fox space Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, and this this actually corresponds to well the, the non-relativistic screening equation. So I h bar d t psi n um, equals that uh, evolves with with the Hamiltonian h. <coughs> um, so, um, so this is all. This is all so far, um, so far fine. But uh, the problem with this type of equation is uh, that, so as we probably know from from the relativistic quantum mechanics of quantum field theory lectures, that um, we get in trouble when we try to uh, have an interacting theory in that way. So um, we, we can write this as a free theory, but that's just that's just. Uh, <laughs> Playing with, with things nicely, but as soon as you want to introduce interactions, uh, yeah, you you get problems. So uh, a Hamiltonian theory of of, uh, of interacting particles on a on a Hilbert space uh, does does not exist. Right? So you you have. What that this one? That's just that's basically the the two particle interaction potential. There are, ah, yeah, yeah, but, um, but, uh, but just of the same type of particle, right? So you have, you have, a, yeah, you have just one kind of, of particle. Right? So you don't have, so if you think of electrodynamics, right, you would just have, you would just have uh, free electrons, for example, but you can't have any, any photons interacting with them. <clears throat> yeah, so um, if we, in, in principle, we know that we need to account for, for particle creation and annihilation, um, 
in, in our theories and yes, and through interactions. Um, and uh, the only known complete uh, relativistic theory that, that does that is, is uh, quantum field theory. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is obviously not a, not a fundamentally correct uh, description. Um, but uh, I, will, I will use this, uh, it uh, later again as, as an approximation. So, um, the, yes. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. The, this is this is correct. As a, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, um, yeah. You should think of it as corrections of the of the non-relativistic theory, right? I mean, it's like yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. You have you have non-relativistic wave functions, right? And you're trying to get like relativistic corrections to them. Of course, if you if you go to to regimes where you have really large velocities, then then that is not that, that is clearly not. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it's clear. It's it's not a it's not a Lorentz invariant theory anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's just an a, an attempt to make a correction to the to the Galilean invariant uh, Schrödinger theory. Um, yeah, without without caring about about full full Lorentz invariant. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So um, another thing then I want to discuss um, as as an introduction is. Um, so if we want to go to, to field theory, we, um, we can consider the Klein-Gordon uh, field. So um, basically we take the, the square of this Hamiltonian, right, in a, in a loose sense that we, that we had. So, um, <clears throat> so we can write our, our Hamiltonian like this and um, now do the replacement of our Hamiltonian by IH bar d by dt. <clears throat> so this is this is n squared d for oh, acting on a field phi here. Um, phi minus uh, IH bar squared phi. So um, if we do this, then we get the Klein-Gordon equation. So zero equals <coughs> the second time derivative of phi minus d squared uh, Laplacian of phi plus m squared c to the fourth divided by h bar squared <coughs> phi. <coughs> so um, Maybe we can so we we can also understand the, the Schrödinger equation as the as the non-relativistic limit of of this Klein-Gordon equation, and um, I want to explicitly uh, do the do the derivation of that um, since that's also something that I will will come back to later. So um, in order to to do this, um, so um, and maybe first of all, so we notice that. Um, Non-relativistic limit means basically having small velocities with respect to the speed of light, or letting the speed of light go to infinity, right? Um, but if you just put z to infinity here in this equation, then you see then you get phi equals zero as 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 the uh, as the lowest order solution. So this does not make any sense. So you have to. Um, It, I think, yeah, it's squared anyways. <laughs> Just, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so we can't just take this, this limit uh, with the reason for which is uh, in, because in the Hamiltonian we have this mc squared term that, uh, that basically gives, uh, gives us a, a phase with we, which we have to, to subtract. So, um, <clears throat> so as an ansatz for our field, 
what we can what we can choose is we can uh, divide out this this uh, phase factor. So um, we write our field uh, as uh, exponential i c squared, and then we put some some phase that we assume can depend on both time and position at this at this point. <clears throat> And this phase factor uh, times times a, a wave function, which we can write as a as a power series in uh, one over c squared. So we have a series of one over c squared to the n, and we call the components we call psi n. Um, if we do this, then I. over here. <clears throat> yeah, so um, first of all, what we can do in this, uh, with this approach um, is we can calculate the, the derivatives. So if we calculate the first time derivative of, of this field phi, um, and what you get is i z squared s dot, and then we have i e to the i b squared s. Um, to minus two n psi n. I think I'm too small again. Yeah. Um, okay, plus um, e to the <coughs> i z squared s. Now we take the derivative of, of our psi n, so we have some, um, and, and I write this, uh, this factor as d squared 1 over c squared to the n plus 1. Um, so, so this we can, so we can take out this, this c squared. So both have a prefactor c squared, and then uh, the rest of this we can also write as the sum from n equals one to infinity um, of c to the minus two n, and then we have to shift our indices, so we get psi n minus one dot, <coughs> and uh, I define all the all the components with negative indices to be to be zero, so psi minus one, psi minus two. All of those are supposed to be zero. Um, so because of this, I can just replace this by a sum from n equals zero. <clears throat> and uh, okay, now I can calculate the second uh, derivative which gives an other uh, z-square factor from the, from the derivative of the exponential function. So we pull out uh, c to the 4, e to the i c squared s, and then we have the sum n equals 0 to infinity e to the minus 2n. And then what we get is uh, minus s dot squared by n. We get... Uh, 2i s dot psi n minus 1 dot. <clears throat> um, and we get uh, second derivative terms of s, i s dot dot psi n minus 1, <clears throat> and psi n minus 2 2 dots. <clears throat> Um, and we can do exactly the same for the for the spatial derivative. So the Laplacian of psi is also c to the four e to the i c squared s, and then we have minus the uh, gradient of s squared psi n plus two i gradient s multiplied with gradient of psi n minus 1 um, plus 
2 you have plus s psi n minus 1 plus uh, Laplace psi n minus 2. <coughs> okay, and And now we can we can insert that into our Klein Gordon equation. So we had uh, zero equals dot 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 minus uh, p squared plus phi plus n squared c to the fourth c minus five to the squared phi. <coughs> so. Um, so this term has, has an uh, additional z squared, so actually we need a prefactor c to the six in total to, <coughs> to write this equation the same way. So we have c to the six, e to the uh, i c squared s. And then all the others, uh, also, so the psi dot dot also gets a, a, a shift of the indices by, by one. Um, and here we have, to, we have to shift by two, so here we get an n minus two. Um, so in total, what we get is c to the minus 2n. <coughs> and then we have minus s dot squared, psi n minus 1, plus 2i uh, x dot, psi n minus 2 x dot, um, plus i x two dot, psi n minus 2. Um, Plus <coughs> gradient s squared uh, psi n minus two i gradient s sorry dot gradient psi n minus one minus i la plus s psi n minus one minus and then plus m squared divided by h bar squared psi n minus, uh, it must be n minus two star. <coughs> Sorry, no, it's minus, yes, n minus one. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> okay. So, um, so this is the Klein-Gordon equation, just rewritten with this, with this ugly expansion. Um, and uh, now we can take the, the uh, non-relativistic limits, and now can, we can take the c to infinity limit um, and basically look at this equation order by order. So basically starting at n equals zero, um, we, we, can, we can demand that, that the term in these, in these brackets uh, must be must be zero. Right? So um, so we start at at n equals zero. So all the terms that have n minus something do not contribute. So this is zero. This is zero. This is zero. This is zero. If those are all zero. So what we find at the lowest order is just that uh, the der spatial derivative of S um, must vanish. So uh, S is a function of time only. <clears throat> that uh, simplifies things a lot. So, um, so this condition actually removes all the spatial derivative terms of, of S. Um, <clears throat> and now we can look at the next, next higher order, so we can insert n equals one. <clears throat> so um, what we get at this level is zero equals minus s dot squared psi zero. 
this term, and then we get the term at the very end, so plus m squared divided by h bar squared psi zero. So we get I start as plus or minus m divided by h bar, or s equals plus minus mt divided by h bar plus zero. <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> okay, and we can insert that uh, here again, and then then uh, this equation that we have. Um, so if we insert that here, then actually this simplifies, so we get the condition zero equals plus or minus two i m divided by h bar i n minus two dot plus psi n minus three, two dots minus plus psi n minus two. <clears throat> and now we can, uh, we can go to the next higher order, uh, n equals two. And, uh, and at this order we get then um, minus plus i h bar dot equals minus h bar squared divided by 2m Laplace. So this is just the Schrödinger equation. So what we what we found from this is that we find well we find two solutions. We find the solution phi plus, which is e to the i m c squared t divided by h bar psi plus, and we find a solution psi minus, which is e to the minus i m c squared t divided by h bar psi minus, where uh, psi plus solves the, uh, solves the Schrödinger equation for, uh, for negative energies um, with the minus here. And the psi minus solves the, the ordinary Schrödinger equation for, for positive energy. <clears throat> so now we could we could go on and and uh, do this calculation at higher orders, right? So at the next order we would just end up with this uh, relativistic corrections of the of the Schrödinger equation, um, and so on. I will leave that to you as an as an exercise. Um, Actually, we will do that. There is a tutorial in the in the afternoon lecture, so um, in the second half of the afternoon lecture. <clears throat> okay, so much for for the for the Klein-Gordon field and the point particle. And um, as the next thing, I would like to give a very brief introduction to uh, to gravity, to general relativity. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so um, maybe first, uh, so, so what, are the, what are the principles and, and the philosophy of, of uh, general relativity? Um, well, the, the idea uh, is, is basically in gravity that we have particles, they are living on some common space-time, that's the same space-time for all the particles. Um, for example, we can describe our matter like also by, by, uh, by a field, like a scalar field. Um, yeah, so, so we can have some, some, some field phi of t of x, right? Um, which is then described on this, on this space-time. Um, our space-time has, a, has a, a Lorentzian signature, so um, uh, 
so, so locally, our spacetime looks like, like Minkowski space. So um, we can, again, we can write the next zero component as C times T. Um, and we can have, we have the, the, the other three components, X1, X2, X3. <coughs> and then we have a, a metric tensor um, that, that's just the Minkowski metric, minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. Um, <coughs> And we can, um, so, so just uh, as, as a definition, so um, for, for notation, so we can write uh, contractions. Uh, so if I write something like x mu, y mu, with uh, indices up and down, that just stands for the sum over mu and nu of eta mu nu uh, x mu y mu. <coughs> So, um, and now the, the new property of, of this space-time, of this, uh, of this Lorentzian, of this manifold, uh, is that it actually has curvature as a property, right? So, um, the, the metric now on the, on the space-time is, is not uh, just uh, eta mu nu anymore, but we actually have a met metric g mu nu uh, of x, which is a space-time function, right? So, um, and, uh, and we use this metric x, uh, sorry, this metric g mu nu to, to raise and lower indices. So, um, so I will, for example, so something like a mu is, is the same as uh, g mu nu a nu and so on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, to describe this, this curvature, we, uh, we have the uh, Riemann curvature tensor, which uh, is R rho sigma mu nu, uh, is defined as the, by the derivatives of the, uh, of the uh, connection, of the levi civita connection. Um, so this is, this is uh, the partial derivative by, by x mu um, of gamma rho nu minus e nu gamma rho uh, nu sigma uh, plus gamma rho e nu lambda um, plus gamma we have uh, sorry times gamma uh, lambda nu sigma minus gamma rho uh, Lambda gamma lambda mu sigma. Um, where the okay, so just for completeness, so the where the, the gammas and the Christoffel symbols that are defined uh, follow. So this is one half. They can be calculated from the matrix. So this is G sigma rho, and then we have the derivatives of the metric components. E mu g mu rho plus e mu g mu rho um, minus e rho g mu nu. <coughs> um, okay, so from this from this uh, Riemann curvature tensor, we define the so-called Ricci tensor, which is r mu nu. It's just the contraction of the first and the third index of this, of this Riemann tensor. So that's R sigma mu sigma nu, okay, where, where you have to sum over, over sigma. And finally, there is the so-called uh, Ricci scalar, which is just the trace of the Ricci tensor, so R mu nu. <coughs> so, um, we have a curved space-time where the curvature is described by the, by the uh, Ricci uh, curvature or, or ultimately by the metric. Um, and uh, now this curvature is actually a dynamic property of the space-time. So this curvature is not just statically given, but the curvature is determined uh, by the matter that's living on this, uh, this space-time. And uh, this is described by Einstein's equations, um, which are 
our R mu nu uh, minus one half G mu nu R. This is also the so-called Einstein tensor, so this is often abbreviated G mu nu, <coughs> and that's given by H P, uh, 8 pi G divided by C to the fourth. And then there is the energy momentum tensor T mu nu on the, on the right hand side. Um, so basically the content of this equation is that you have the curvature of space time. The curvature of space time is the geometry that tells matter how to move. And on the right hand side you have the, the energy content of your, of your matter that tells your space time how to curve. So you have this interaction between, between matter and, uh, and space time. Um, yes, and these uh, Einstein equations can also um, de be derived from a, from a Lagrangian formulation. So you can have the so-called uh, Einstein <coughs> Einstein Hilbert uh, Lagrangian, which is just square root minus g. This is the determinant of the of the metric times r. Or um, if you want to write it as an as an action principle, you can have the Einstein Hilbert action, so that's just integral d for x of this of this tensor, square root minus g. Um, and then if you write it with the dimensions, then you get c to the four sixteen pi g r. And if you also want to include your matter fields to to uh, that that belong to your t mu nu then you have your matter Lagrangian, so the Lagrangian of all your matter fields uh, here. That's, so if you then do the usual uh, variation, so, so you demand that the variation of this, of this action is zero, then you obtain the, the Einstein field equation. Um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about is the, uh, the Newtonian limit of this this theory. Um, for this, uh, the first step is usually to, to go to the linearized uh, Einstein equation. So the metric G mu nu is actually written as the, the flat Minkowski metric, eta mu nu, plus some correction to the Minkowski metric, h mu nu. <coughs> um, and then we need uh, some convention. Which is that we now use the eta mu nu metric to raise and lower indices. So we write a mu now means um, eta mu nu a mu. So that's true for every time when an index is uh, raised and lowered, that happens with eta mu nu except for the metric G itself. So, um, so uh, G mu nu, G mu nu, is the one, that's the, that's the identity. <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> so instead of, so, so this is, uh, yeah, so, so G mu nu is actually the, 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 the inverse, so, um, Otherwise, g mu nu would be eta uh, mu alpha eta nu beta g alpha beta. Right, so this is this is not what we have. Um, <coughs> okay, so we can then we can derive the the Christoffel symbols from that. So. Um, Okay, so, so the derivatives of, of the Minkowski metric are, are zero because the Minkowski metric doesn't, doesn't change on space-time. Um, so what we have is actually eta, sigma rho, and then we just have the derivatives of the, of the h part. So h nu rho plus e nu h mu rho. Um, minus e rho h mu nu plus 
and then there are terms of order h squared. Um. <clears throat> Um, other notation I will write H, that's the that's H mu nu, so, so H is eta mu nu H mu nu. Um, okay, so with this we can calculate the, the, um, the Ricci tensor. So that's just the derivatives, D sigma of uh, gamma sigma mu nu. Uh, minus p mu of gamma sigma sigma mu. <clears throat> which gives one half um, then we have the sigma eta sigma rho um, Brackets d nu rho plus d nu uh, h mu rho minus rho h mu nu <coughs> minus one half uh, d mu eta rho sigma. Um, Um, d sigma h mu rho plus d nu h sigma rho minus rho h sigma nu. <coughs> so, um, okay, now we can, now it makes <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, e rho d mu h mu rho. <clears throat> um, plus d rho d nu h mu rho. <clears throat> Rho H mu nu, and then we have Rho H mu Rho minus P mu D mu um, H. So that's P mu D Rho. Um, okay, <clears throat> that's just uh, using this metric to, to uh, raise and lower the indices, and um, we see that um, this term and this term actually cancel. <clears throat> and Oh, this H, that's, that's what I wrote there, H mu mu. Um, yes, so, um, so we, have, we have our uh, Ricci tensor and now we, can, now we can also calculate the Ricci scalar, eta mu nu, r mu nu. Which gives one half uh, d rho d nu h mu rho plus d rho d mu h mu rho. Oh, um, 
Um, sorry, that's not. Um, so the needle, um, and then we have. Um, minus uh, D rho D rho H minus uh, D mu D mu so that's just all erasing all these uh, all these news as a as a mu um, okay and then we then we see that this just results, so there are um, terms that are equal. Actually, those two terms are equal, and those two terms are equal. So what we get is uh, d rho, d mu, h mu rho, uh, minus d rho, d rho, h. <coughs> <coughs> okay, and uh, with these, we can then get our Einstein tensor. D mu nu equals r mu nu minus one half r. Sorry, s m mu r equals one half. And then we have all these terms together. So we have d rho, d mu, h mu rho plus d rho d mu h mu rho um, minus d rho d rho h mu nu minus d mu d mu h um, minus eta mu nu d rho d Sigma H sigma rho and then plus eta mu nu <coughs> D rho D mu rho H. Okay. <coughs> so um, what we do now to, to further simplify this is we introduce um, H bar mu nu as an abbreviation, which is uh, H mu nu minus one half eta mu nu H and <clears throat> and with this uh, one can see that Simplifies if I insert that. Um, you can check that at home or later. Um, I just write the result now, so that then we get d rho d mu uh, h mu rho bar plus uh, d rho d mu h bar mu rho minus rho d rho h bar mu nu minus eta mu nu uh, d rho d sigma h bar sigma <coughs> okay um, so that's the Einstein tensor written in, in this in this h bar metric <coughs> But uh, so so in in general relativity we have uh, we have a gauge freedom so we have uh, we have the invariance of the theory under under space time diffeomorphisms so um, uh, you have you have a certain freedom just like in electrodynamics to to choose a to choose a gauge and uh, the the gauge that is usually chosen is the so-called uh, harmonic gauge or uh, also the Donder gauge. Um, which is to choose the, the h bar such that um, d nu of h bar uh, mu nu equals zero. Okay, so that's and with this, 
this Einstein tensor uh, simplifies significantly, we get minus one half e rho d rho h bar mu. So we end up with the Einstein equations being uh, d rho d rho h bar mu nu equals minus 16 pi g divided by c to the fourth p mu nu. Okay, so if where? Um, excuse me, where are you here? Oh, this is this is eta mu nu. Yeah, yeah. No, it's eta eta mu nu. Um, because we do the we do the expansion, right? This this R is already order H, so um, so so if you would have H mu nu there, then. Yeah, yeah, that's something called, you have, you have, you do the, this expansion of the metric, right? You write the metric as eta plus h. Um, so in R, we already have terms of order h. So if we would, so, so this is also, so in principle, you have g mu nu here, right? But, but only the eta mu nu contributes and gives terms of order h. The, the h mu nu term would give, would give higher order terms. Um, yeah, so we have, we end up with this equation and um, if we uh, discuss, if we look at the, the, the stress energy tensor now, then um, the, the components of this, of the stress energy tensor are actually that the um, P0 zero, zero component is uh, C to the fourth times the, the mass density rho, okay, so, or the energy density. Um, so this is the, the energy density uh, contribution. Um, so in, in general, you have the energy density, but then you know that uh, we have, in principle, the energy is mc squared plus e. So in the, uh, the non-relativistic uh, limit, the, the mass contribution is, is the dominant one. So uh, the dominant part of this T0, zero, zero is, the, is the mass density rho. Um, and then we have the T0i components. Um, those are the momentum contributions or velocity contributions. So since uh, we want the, the uh, non-relativistic limit now or we want uh, uh, low energies now, um, the uh, momentum is, is, or the velocities are considered uh, small compared to the, the speed of light. So. Um, so these are, are small compared to, compared to T00, zero zero. and the same is true for the uh, Tij components, which are the, uh, the stress tensor. Or if you talk about the fluid, for example, that would basically be the, the pressure of the, of the fluid. Um, <clears throat> So since we, since we non-relativistically uh, say that the rest mass energy is dominant and we, we uh, can, can neglect uh, momentum and, and stress terms, um, what, we, what we end up with in the, in the non-relativistic limit here is, uh, is uh, only the zero zero component of this equation uh, is relevant and uh, mm. And then we have uh, the, the derivatives, uh, that, so the, the um, sorry, the time derivatives here, d0, d0, um, are, also, are also small if you consider that you have uh, slowly varying sources, right? That the sources of your gravitational field are moving, are moving slow compared to the speed of the light. Um, then you get only the, the space derivatives here. So, um, so what we end up with is we have the Laplacian of H mu nu um, coming just from the from the spatial components here. Um, 
equals uh, minus 16 pi g times the mass density rho. <coughs> and um, we can now compare that to, uh, to Newton's, uh, Newton's law for gravity, where you have uh, the Poisson equation, Laplace phi equals uh, 4 pi g rho. Then you see that uh, you, in this way, you recover uh, Newton's law from, from Einstein's equations um, for where the, where the potential is so, so phi as uh, minus one fourth uh, H zero zero. Yes, this is T zero zero. This is oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> of course. Um, this is this is H zero zero. <clears throat> um, yeah, since we have T zero, so we only we have we get. Uh, in total, we get ten equations, right? Um, but all the all the ones that are not zero zero um, are are just uh, yeah are, are negligible. Yes, and we just look at the same equations. I'm sorry, that was just a mistake. Um, thank you. <clears throat> um, okay, so as uh, as the next thing and. <laughs> so now we we uh, have learned how to how to um, how to get Newtonian gravity from from general relativity. Um, so now we want to slowly approach the actual topic of, of our of our lecture, right, which is uh, how do we how do we couple quantum matter to gravity, or how do we describe uh, quantum matter with gravitation. Um, so um, how do we do that with uh, classical matter? Um, and uh, so the first thing to consider is uh, the uh, minimal coupling principle. So if you have some matter field, and you want to couple it to, uh, or you have some matter, you know, right? And you want to couple it to gravity, then the usual prescription um, has three steps. So um, the first step would be to find a special rel relativistic, so find a Poincaré invariant. Uh, description of our formulation of your matter field. Then the second step is um, to replace the Minkowski metric by the, the um, curved space-time metric, the Lorentzian metric, uh, G mu nu, and uh, at the same time replace all the partial derivatives in your field equations by the covariant derivatives with respect to, with respect to this metric. Okay. So um, for a scalar field, that's just that's just the same, right? So the, the partial derivatives are just the same as the as the um, covariant derivatives for a vector field, for example. Uh, the covariant derivative uh, is, is 
partial derivative plus the connection uh, gamma mu, so gamma nu mu uh, sigma r. <coughs> so that's step two. And step three, I need the paper. Um, and then step three would be <coughs> to calculate the energy momentum tensor for your field on curved space time, which is p mu nu is minus 2 divided by square root minus g. And then you have the variation of square root minus g Lagrangian divided by, or varied by the so this is how you obtain the, the energy momentum tensor. And then <coughs> this uh, goes into, into Einstein's equation. <coughs> and then you have the description of your metal field on your curved space. So now we can think about what happens if we try to apply that procedure to, to quantum matter. And it actually turns out that the problems appear already in the first step because for a quantum particle, we don't have a special relativistic formulation as we just found out before. We always have the problem that we have particle creation and annihilation, so we don't have a one particle a relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, so for quantum mechanics, we can't really, uh, we can't even make it beyond step one. So um, we can try to find a way around that, right? We can, in principle, what we need to do is um, we need to formulate a relativistic quantum field theory on a curved space time. And then, which is already complicated by itself, right? That's its own research field, quantum field theory on, on curved space time. So um, yes, of course. In, uh, with, with the, um, it's not, um, well, it's just as a classical equation, you can, of course, couple it, just like you can with the klein gordon equation, right? But it's, it's, not really, it's not really quantum as long as you just take the Dirac equation as a, as a field equation. I mean, it's just, it's just describing a classical object only after you, only if you take a quantum field theory with the, with the Dirac equation, you actually can create quantum activity. I mean, the, the Dirac equation is just, just as much, just as little a quantum. Yeah, it's not quantum. Yeah, it's just as much uh, quantum mechanics as the as the Klein gordon equation is. But it, it's not, there is not really a difference, in, in my opinion, in taking the Dirac equation from taking the Klein gordon equation. <coughs> and yeah, we can talk later. Okay. Um, <coughs> But uh, this, of course, you can do so. So, um, okay, so in general, we would need quantum field theory on the curved space time, right? Then we could calculate our, our T mu nu. Um, so what we can do instead is, um, is uh, we can consider a classical, uh, classical field. So we can consider the classical uh, Klein gordon Klein gordon field. And I want to just very briefly um, from a long calculation already. Um, I'll briefly outline that. Um, so, so if we take uh, the Klein-Gordon field, then we have uh, we have Einstein's equations. Um, And we have the Klein-Gordon equation on curved space-time, which is this equation. So it's 1 divided by square root minus g, uh, dmu of uh, square root minus g, d mu nu, d mu phi equals n squared c squared minus 
average phi. So um, then we can calculate the stress energy tensor for the Klein Gordon field, um, which turns out to be h bar squared divided by 2m. Um, 2 d mu phi d mu phi. Um, I do it for a, for, a, um, for a real valued field here in principle. You can do the same for a complex field and um, you end up with the same result essentially. Um, so uh, g mu nu, d sigma phi, d sigma phi, um, plus m squared c squared divided by two. Okay. Um, and now um, I don't do that because it's much more complicated. But now we can do the same expansion that we did before with the with the Glen Gordon field on flat space time. So we can we can make the same the same ansatz with the exponential phase, um, and we can uh, look at this equation order by order. And what we find then at the lowest order is yes. We are now basically uh, looking at, no, we are now looking, we are still classically, we are now coupling a classical field instead of, so we are now coupling the classical Klein Gordon field to Einstein's equations. So. Yeah, there is nothing quantum here. This is all classical. Yes, yes, everything is classical. Okay. Yeah, we have an H bar there, but H bar is just a constant. I mean, there is, yeah. No, it comes from the from the uh, from the Klein Gordon equation. The Klein Gordon equation just has the for, for dimension uh, reasons, right? If you if you um, um, it comes from the, yes, the, uh, if you write the Lagrangian for the Klein Gordon field, you need an H bar for just for dimension reasons, just to get the dimension time. Um, okay, so, um, so we have these equations, and we want to do the same procedure as before, um, and we will end up with, with an equation in general that looks like this. So we will get the Schrödinger equation, IH bar psi dot, equals minus h bar squared divided by 2m plus psi. And then we get an additional potential term, m by psi, where this potential is actually restricted by Einstein's equations now. So we can do the same expansion for Einstein's equations. We can look at Einstein's equations order by order. So for the Einstein equations, then we basically just do what we did there. So we take the Newtonian limit of the Einstein equation and get the Poisson equation for phi equals 4 pi zm. And then we have absolute value psi squared as the, as the source. So. Here, where this comes from, um, by doing the same uh, expansion that we did before for the for the free Klein Gordon equation. This this long calculation that I did with all the we do we do phi equals e to the minus i m c squared divided by h bar t phi. Okay, so so we write. Okay, and then we get this coupled set of equations. Yeah, so. This is this is just everything is classical now. This is this is the, the non-relativistic limit of the classical Einstein Klein Gordon equation. So a classical Klein Gordon field coupled to Einstein equations uh, taking the non-relativistic limit. Um, yeah, I'm just just 
to you can actually do exactly the same thing for the for the complex field, and it's just that the energy momentum tensor gets a bit longer, but that's all that changes. Um, yeah, you should. If I if I'm if I'm consistent, I should write it like this. If you do it for a complex field, then you end up with this. Um, there is really there is no difference except that all expressions you have to write twice. Um, <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so we end up with this, um, and just as the very last thing before I finish, so um, now what you can actually do is you can integrate this, this Poisson equation and, and write it into your Schrodinger equation, and you end up with, with one integral differential equation, I h bar psi dot, cross p and r equals minus h bar squared divided by 2m. Plus, and then we have minus gm squared integral r prime psi of p r prime squared divided by r minus r prime. And that whole thing And uh, this equation, that's a nonlinear Schrödinger equation, and it's also is, uh, called the Schrödinger-Newton equation. Um, and just again, so here we derive it as a completely classical equation. It's just describing a classical field. Um, and we will come back to this equation later again in the, in the context of, uh, of quantum matter on, on a classical space-time. Um, yeah, but for now, that's... That's that, and then I see you again this afternoon.